I got it. Done deal with bad people. So we have to pay back on time. This is a text message sent from Michael's phone to his wife, Diane. You know I only want you to be happy. Then I'm going to drown sorrows. Police believe by the time this text message was sent, Michael was already dead. I should rewind a little here. We got so focused on Kenny's story, we took too long to take a closer look at Diane. We will come back to those messages later. Diane tells police Michael came home at 8 a.m. on the 29th of December. She says they talk about their financial problems, and strangely, she also claims they had sex. Then, at 3 p.m., she supposedly watches Michael drive off for a business meeting. Diane stays at the house all day and eventually leaves in the afternoon to go to the dentist. Security cameras show Diane visited this service station. She fuels up, she buys a pack of cigarettes and a pair of dark sunglasses. We know she arrived at the dentist at 5.16 p.m. But what is disturbing is what happens between here and the dentist. We have the mobile phone records for both Michael and Diane's phone. I'm working on this um, murder story at the moment and I think it's got something in it that um, might be in your area of expertise. You know all about phone towers and triangulation and so forth, don't you? Yeah, I know a bit about it when I was doing jobs, yeah. I'll do my best. I mean, you know, I'm a cop now, don't you? Yeah. It's a cold case now, basically. We're just having a look over it. The mobile phone towers, uh, how many of them are there? How how widespread are they in a city, in a major city? Uh, in, a, in a major city, it varies. It's usually pretty close. Now, most of them don't cover an area bigger than, say, eight or nine kilometres. Mm. So they're overlapping constantly. Two text messages were sent from Michael's phone to Diane's phone. The first at 4.25 p.m. Remember, police say by now, Michael was already dead. I got it. Done deal with bad people. So we have to pay back on time, also interest. We'll fix those f ups. Good luck at dentist. Got 50,000 so I can fix everything. The next message comes six minutes later. I'll put 5,000 in your savings for you. You and kids deserve it after what I've put you through last couple of months. Then I'm gonna drown sorrows. If Michael is already dead, clearly he didn't send those messages. Someone was using his phone. One explanation, someone sent a text message to themselves to make it seem like Michael was still alive and dealing with dangerous people. We take a drive to find the cell phone tower that relayed the message. So it was sent, the first one was sent and received from this tower. At 4.25 p.m., yep. Happen, you're from the news. This is the very phone tower that received that message from Michael's phone. And to be clear, it's 34 kilometres from the family home. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because that is the same phone tower that delivered that message to Diane's phone, meaning both phones were very close to here. Now, we also have the phone tower records and it shows something else. The message was sent from 129 degrees. That is right there. So the two phones were close together. First phone tower took an SMS message from a direction of 129 degrees true north. A second tower also took a reading, this time at 219 degrees. 
This is the exact spot where those two lines intersect, which means the person who had those mobile phones either came to go to the plaza or, more likely, the RSL. We start with the plaza. It's packed with security cameras. It's no surprise, really. Back from 2005, they don't have the security camera records. The cameras here get wiped every 60 days. But the real question is, did police check back then? We know Diane was a chronic pokies addict. So next, we hit up the nearby RSL, hoping for at least the old sign-in book. Well, frustratingly, the RSL only keeps its sign-in records for a period of seven years. So I don't fancy our chances of turning much up. We did get one lead, however. The RSL general manager at the time was Graham Keating. He might remember something. What was your name again, sorry? It's Taylor. Taylor, just hang on a second. Thank you. Graham Keating is a common name. We were just hoping to get in touch with Graham Keating. We have that and a photo, and that's it. Oh, hey. hello, ma'am. Um, we're looking for Graham Keating. Yeah. How you going? Hey. Why do I know where? your face? Channel 7. Yeah, I know you which. So at the time when Graham was general manager there? No, that's not this Graham Keating. Uh, ah, different. Yeah. Oh. Ah. Thank God. Ah. Oh, what the f has he done now? <laughs> uh, um, no, sorry. Uh, no. no. Hello, Graham Keating. Yeah, Denim. You're a hard man to find. Boy. I've travelled across two states to find you. Hey, this is a nice place. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Home gym and everything. Yeah. But I might get you just to turn the um, sound down on the TV, yeah. that's okay. Mm. Um, so how long were you the general manager at the RSL? All up 26 years. This story that we're looking into would have been a big story at the time for that area. Do you remember the story? I remember it vaguely. Um, I had a son living at Pakenham and, and when I heard it was at Pakenham, I was a bit interested. Uh, long shot, I know, because a long time ago, but this is the, the woman we're trying to track her path. It's Diane Griffey. Yeah, it's a... I, I, I don't, don't remember. We, we had um, a lot going on at that time. Fair enough that you wouldn't remember the person. It was 15 years ago, I understand that, but you probably would remember if police came asking about this particular event. No, I can't, can't say that I remember directly. That would be something you'd remember, I would have thought. A story this big, they're asking about a particular woman connected to this case. Yeah, I, I think I would have remembered if they had have come and, and, and explained it like that. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tanner. Security footage from either the plaza or the RSL could have proved who had the mobile phones. It would have made what came next far easier. Four days after Michael's murder, four days, it was Gillian, his girlfriend, who finally made the call. So the 2nd of January, you called police? Well, I just said that, you know, we'd made plans and I've been trying to contact him for how many days? Four days or something and you know I, I just feel there's something wrong because it's not in his character um, and she wrote it all down and said she would look into it yeah diane and cassie were at rodney meekin's house in alexandra when police called to say michael was missing they packed up and drove an hour or so back to pakenham they did not make a single phone call not to michael not to anyone that night, they enter the garage and would later tell police they noticed a lump under a grey tarpaulin and blood on the floor. Without going near it, they called Triple O, then family. I remember the smell being horrific and throwing up. I remember getting around the corner and throwing up and thinking, how could that have been my dad? How could it have come to that? Diane was visibly shaken, she was crying. Cassie wasn't making a sound, not one sound. Um, and my older sister, she was a mess, the same as I was.
Detectives question Diane. She tells them she could see the body was covered by a striped sheet, and it was. But the sheet was under the grey tarpaulin, not visible from any angle. Then they find this. In the event of Michael's death, Diane would receive $1.5 million. This would trigger a sensational development in the case. Diane and Kenny are arrested for murder. Quizzed for eight hours by detectives who later charged his mother, Kenny Griffey, was in no mood for more questions. Nicknamed Boof, the sprint car racer was arrested yesterday. It's the worst memory I have, is being told that you're under arrest for the, the murder of your father. I'm so... Sorry. I got dragged out of a truck with five detectives and put in handcuffs a month after I find out my dad's been murdered. And told that I killed him. And told for 10 hours that I killed him and all the different ways that I did it. I, it's a complete waste of time. I didn't kill him. It kills me to think about it. I didn't do it. Kenny was questioned all night, but released without charge the next day. Diane was charged with murder. Knowing her as you did, yep. could Diane, could your mother have killed your father? Absolutely, without a question of doubt. Uh, he wasn't beaten to death hand to hand. He was attacked with a hammer. She is a hard woman. Everybody talks about closure. You know, we want closure, we, want, we need a conviction because it's going to give us closure. Well, from what I know, the only two people that may be convicted are my younger sister and my mother. That's my closure. It's, it's rough, it's unique, it's, it's horrible. There's nothing good about it. Nothing is more important than the truth. Yeah. With Diane pleading not guilty, for three long years, prosecutors worked on the case, but there was one more twist to come. On the eve of Diane's murder trial, Cassandra Griffey confessed to killing her father. Diane's trial was sensationally aborted. When Cassie confessed to murdering your father, yep. what did you think? I wondered if there was more to it because it seemed really good timing that uh, Diane was just about to go into trial and all of a sudden Cassie comes out and says that she killed Dad. Uh, it, was, it, it seemed a bit odd. What happened to the case against your mother after she confessed? Yeah, well, the, the charges were dropped. Timing is everything. All Diane's defence needed was reasonable doubt, and a confession from Cassie would easily cover that. The prosecution case collapsed. Then, two months later, despite the confession, the investigation into Cassie also failed due to lack of evidence. Elise couldn't prove it. Incredibly, Diane and Cassie walked free. Right. Hey. Sorry, but I know it's late, but uh, Taylor sent me this message. Says you're not going to believe this. Come to the room. So I figured, since you're just down the corridor, you may as well come. Yo. Hey. Hey, mate. You are, you are not going to believe this. Come on. What is it? Well, it's a confession. A video confession. Bullshit. Is that right, I think it is? <laughs> Diane and Cassie, Michael's wife, Michael's daughter. In the next episode, we track them down to ask some difficult questions. That leads to a major breakthrough. <laughs>